Amen. I'd like to introduce Pete. <clears throat> Pete is a co-founder of Deliberate You. It's a company that helps business owners uh, bring about transformation not only in their own lives and in the lives of their companies, but particularly it also helps them run their businesses kingdom smart, as Pete calls it. The goal of Deliberate You is for each business leader to have a lasting a lifelong impact on those who they serve. Pete is a, a veteran business owner and entrepreneur, and he knows the opportunities and the challenges that face business leaders across Canada. In fact, he's also worked with leaders not only in Canada, but North America and around the world. He's held many leadership positions in both public and private organizations at both management, executive and board level. Currently, he serves on the national leadership team for the Navigators of Canada. Kathy and he live in Bracebridge and have four grown children. Uh, to me, Pete is not only a speaker and not only a business leader, but a personal friend. I've mm -hmm. always been thrilled with, with what, Bill, what Pete and I, when we've gone for coffee, our famous little Starbucks downtown Guelph, as we sit there and reflect together on what God's doing in our lives, I'm always inspired. And so I know today as he presents, much as he did back in February, you might recall, he'll be an inspiration to each of us. So Pete, We'd love to hear from you how vision can captivate us and our those that we serve in our company. Well, very good, uh, Don, and uh, great to be with you this afternoon. Uh, looking forward to it. Um, um, is it is it afternoon for everybody? Uh, no, uh, or is it uh, not you, Marvin? Right? Not yet. No, it is. I'm I'm in Cambridge. So. Oh, you're in Cambridge. There you go. Sorry, uh, my apologies. Uh, so there you go. Well, good good afternoon to uh, to everybody. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about uh, this piece. When Don asked me back early summer, I think it was, and uh, Senator Vision, I said, Oh, absolutely. This this one here is very near and dear to the, to my heart. Um, it's this, this one's been a, been a journey. You know, when you hear your bio, as you may have listened to yours, somebody talk about you at some event or whatever it is, you're listening to that. And I'm listening to Don talk about those things. And, and I'm sitting here and, and I'm looking across. So my client, my dear friend, uh, Jeff's office is sitting right on Lake Ontario. I'm looking across at the skyline uh, to the uh, skyline for Toronto. I can see it just as I'm looking at it right now. And um uh, I'm really humbled. I'm humbled by what the Lord is inviting us into. Mm. I'm feeling really humbled, and I want to invite you into that space with me. I invite you to slow down your inner person, however you came into the call, to hear what the Lord may have for you as I walk us through some things that are really part of my story. Um, they are the journey of the Father and me, my Father, my King Jesus, and uh, his very patient presence in this crazy entrepreneur, this crazy person who comes alongside others, and his profound patience with me. So I'm sharing with you just uh, out of a lot of thought and experience and uh, no shortage of pain at times. Um, when I think of vision, uh, there's some things that uh, um, I'm going to be inviting us into. Now, here's what I'm not going to be doing today. I'm not going to be walking through the, the strategies of vision and how to put it all together. I'm going to give it a little bit of background around a model we use, but that's going to be very much in brief. Um, I'm going to be inviting you to sit in a series of scriptures with me. And hear what the Lord may have for you as a leader as you think about vision, vision for your own life and vision for your business. And a greater calling that I am inviting us into that um, in some circles is talked about, but not very many. And I wanna invite us into this space. And so if you can uh, assume a posture, whatever that looks like for you, maybe it's eyes closed, uh, maybe it's uh, just kind of settle in your chair a little bit and uh, just create some space for the spirit of our living God to um, speak to you. And I'm just going to invite him into our presence here. So Jesus, um, thank you for these uh, wonderful people. And as leaders, we choose to be still because we do want to know that you are God. 
not just conceptually, but in the now, in this moment, Spirit, would you speak to us? Everyone in this call and those that are not here, Father, we desire that your kingdom would come here and now, not just in the future. It's here. It's near, as you've declared. So help us in our leadership to pause, to reflect, to hear that still small voice that reminds us of your truths around how, how this is just supposed to happen for us as leaders in the spaces that you have each of us. So Spirit, would you just inform our thinking as we do this good work together in your strong name, Jesus, we invite you into our midst. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to walk us through um, a series of slides, as you will see, and uh, I might be inviting some of you just to read with us, so just stay tuned to that. I want to walk us through just a, a backdrop uh, around some things, but I want to set it up first. I'm going to share a screen, then I know uh, we're going to have some, some good time to uh, have discussion uh, once I walk through this, and so, uh, but but. As we're going through it, uh, raise your hand and uh, or just speak out. Hey, Pete, can I just talk about that? I'm good to do that. Uh, I'm not scripted here. Um, I'm very good to ebb and flow with uh, what's meaningful for you as we work through this. So that in mind, let me do this. Okay, so a vision that captivates. Um, I want to start off with uh, a couple of verses as I invite you into uh, the transforming power of what Jesus would have for us. And these are going to be some uh, verses that you're probably familiar with. You've heard over time. This is out of King James, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. In the message, just beautiful rendering uh, from Eugene Peterson, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. And so we, there's our calibration around this word vision. You, you go to uh, chapters or now indigo rather, and you, there's books upon books upon books of vision. You've got um, much that's been done from a research perspective. But today I want to invite us into seeing what does God see when he thinks of this word vision? What is happening around us as we think of the people around us? Think of your own lives. That when you lose sight of God, when you lose your vision, I think you would agree. We begin to stumble. I stumble all over myself. And if you watch the people in the, that are in your employ, if that's your situation as an owner or maybe as a leader, um, you, you see people stumbling all over themselves. And so then as we, as we do this, uh, the model that we use when we talk about vision with our clients, it comes uh, from Jim Collins and Jerry Parras, uh, Built to Last. Um, it comes out of some Harvard work that they did, and it goes back a number of dec a couple of decades now, uh, back to 1996. But I haven't found one yet that is as robust and complete. There's so much confusion in our language out there. So I just wanted to clarify when I use the word vision and the work that we do with our clients. Here's what I mean by that. I'm, I'm making sure that our clients have learned what the core is for their business around their the purpose and the values of their company. And then they use language that's so beautifully invitational around the envisioned future. And so we can stimulate progress. So that's when I'm talking about that, that's all that I'm going to give you around that right now. I'm not going to go into the mechanics around how we use that and when we use it and the processes we use. But I wanted to make sure that we're clear in terms of what, what that looks like for us. And so as we think about the, the journey here, the other thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that we're clear in what we mean by the word captivate. And so I go to good old Miriam Webster, and here's what Webster says uh, for us. is to influence and dominate by some special charm, art, trait with an irresistible appeal. So when we're thinking of vision, does it have an irresistible appeal? 
And you're going to hear me speak to, as I walk us through the five keys for a captivating vision, the irresistible nature of Jesus and how that is to flow through us into the vision that we bring to our teams and the people that we're entrusted with. So my question for you and for me is, so what vision are you wanting your team to captivate? What does that look like? What does that sound like? And how does Jesus and his scriptures inform our thinking? Because I suggest that he's inviting us to think differently about vision. And my question for you and for me even today, and I, it's a question for me daily, is can I still see it? Can I still see it? So one of the things that I see clearly in the scriptures when it comes to vision is the word love. And you are, I'm sure, are quite familiar with the great commandment. And uh, Marvin, why don't you read that for us, if you don't mind? <clears throat> uh, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbors yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Mm -hmm. Matthew thank 20. You. Okay, sorry. No, no, that's fine. No, no, thank you for that. And my question is, does the great commandment, is that informing your sense of the vision, the calling of the Lord in your own life, and the calling and the purposes of the business that he has entrusted to you? How is the great commandment informing your thinking for your vision? What about investment? And Eden, why don't you read that for us, if, uh, if you don't mind? Investment. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach this new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank you, Eden. How is the Great Commission informing your sense of vision for your life and for your business? These are the two greats. We have a third one that we talk about in terms of deliberate you around the great call, the beauty of work the beauty of adding value to people's lives through business and commerce. Um, but at the end of the day, in this example here, how is the Great Commission informing your, the vision for your life and that of your business? What about transformation? Um, Ruby, would you, uh, a, a cohort from the North, uh, so glad to have you on the call. Would you read that for us? So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best that you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out readily recognizing what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Great, Ruby. Thank you. Thank you. How, how are how is the call to be transformed in the NIV? It says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How is the call to be transformed informing your vision of self and for your business? What about growth? Uh, Peggy, would you read that for us, please? Sure. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They're like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. 
They're like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the waters. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Jeremiah 17. Very good. We're designed to grow. People are designed to grow. You go to Genesis 127. It's a fundamental tenet of the design of people in terms of how the Lord has made us. We're designed to grow. What about fruitfulness? Um, but the Holy Spirit produce, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And there is no law against these things. Again, the design of people, obviously the context here is that they have the indwelling of the Spirit. I get that. But the design in Genesis 127 as image bearers, this is what's possible. Do I see that for myself? And do I see that as possibilities for the people entrusted to me? So when I think of the opportunity to grow, and this is really nice, a captivating vision, but man, we have a big problem. Houston, we have a problem. We have a really big problem. And I just, I pulled up some recent stats, went into that and just updated my own thinking. This is like 2021, 85% of employees are not engaged at work. 85%. Now, COVID... Uh, some of the other research I've been reading, COVID and uh, the impact of COVID on 20, in 21 and 2021 and 2022 is that they're calling it the year of turnover. People are exhausted and they're just looking for some change that's going to actually maybe fix the malaise that's in their inner person. This is a huge deal as an employer. 81% are looking to leave their jobs for something different. 74% of the younger employees, they would rather go do something in their ideal job. They would rather take a pay cut, 21%. But here's the beautiful thing. If we actually learn to lead and, and run a kingdom sharp, smart business where people are fully engaged, the profits go through the roof. And I got all sorts of other data that I can share with you around that. Uh, but for today's purposes, I just want to highlight that Houston, we have a big problem and a significant kingdom opportunity. So the solution is this, and I love this passage in Romans 8. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition and entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by the fraction of human nature, could never have done that. The law was the always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, we couldn't deliver is accomplished. And instead of redoubling our own efforts, just note that, we embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. That is the invitation for you and me as kingdom leaders entrusted with business. Is that we engage with the living Jesus and what he has called us to do. So I... I look at this, and our calling, the vision for our lives is we are to put on the new nature and be renewed as we learn to know our creator and become like him. That's the invitation for you and for me and our leadership. If we are looking to have a kingdom to impact in our business, the calling first is to become like him. That's where it starts. So with that in mind, I got five keys based on how I've set this up that I'm going to move through quickly. But I want to invite you into thinking now. So um, outside, yeah, I have lots of tools around the mechanics of vision and all that sort of stuff. But this is at the heart of the matter if we take our calling seriously as a kingdom leader. Don't export what you haven't imported. It's all about design. Don't cast a vision. Invite people to share it. Learn how to make it resonate. And heads up, get ready for the fall because it, it, will, it will come. So I'm going to walk through each of these five, um, but those are the five keys. And again, uh, we'll be sharing the uh, keynote with you. And I've got a tool that I'm going to be sharing with you after the fact anyways, uh, that I think will, will be, uh, be helpful for you. So number one, don't export what you haven't imported. You and I, I could walk you through just so many scriptures around an authentic life in Christ. I don't know about you, um, but have you ever experienced vision statements, purpose statements, mission, guiding principle statements, whatever the language is of the day, 
where you see really, really nice posters on walls and you're talking with the leader and you're going, okay, there's something's not fitting well here. Has anybody ever been there where the nice words on walls are not matching the reality of how they're living? Mm -hmm. It's every day. And if I'm true and being honest here, which is I invited you to that spot, the beautiful place of humility is that I don't have it figured out all either. Years ago, I was in an engagement with a multinational. I, uh, I flew down into the heart of Texas and the, uh, uh, to go to their corporate uh, international headquarters. Uh, the host uh, met me in the foyer and as I was being greeted there, I looked at behind the reception desk and I had no, no embellishment here, was likely two and a half to three stories of this beautiful rock wall in this massive glass atrium, water cascading over the wall in the stone were etched the purpose and the values of that organization. Like, oh my gosh, I have died and gone to heaven, so to speak. Unbelievable. Well, the host took me upstairs, multi floors, up to the C suite, started to meet people, et cetera, et cetera. At the coffee, uh, at the coffee room, you could hear one executive dropping the F bomb around another one. You go into, I met the sales team, and they were grinding and chewing on clients. And the whole story ended up that the clothes that they say they wear by this beautiful entrance in the atrium, they do not, they had not done the work of fitting the clothes well to them. And there's just nice cheap words on the wall. They had not learned how to import and live out the very things that they were aspiring or at least communicating. Now, we've got lots of stories of companies that have nice, uh, nice uh, value statements and purpose statements, calling, mission statements, whatever the languages of the day. But at the end of the day, when you think WorldCom and Enron, tens of thousands of families wrecked by, uh, at, at some level, an evil that was pervasive, even though they purported really, really nice language in their vision statements. Don't export what you haven't imported. We just, uh, did, I did another engagement recently with a, uh, a client down here in the Niagara area. Um, and again, for two years, the seven core leaders have all been working at understanding what it means to walk better with Jesus. So when we actually rolled up the vision, it had credibility with the team. That's the work of leaders to make sure that we're credible in our walk with the Lord and how we bring it to the teams. So the first key to captivating a vision is just decide to be credible. Live it out yourself. Don't export what you haven't imported. The second one is it's all about design. If you want to have a captivating uh, vision, tap into the God-given design in every person in your employee. And my conviction is Genesis 127 is just rich in front of me with every person. Every person. When I speak in front of groups, I look at them and say, wow, Father, you've made them. You have made them. And do I see them as you see them? Do you see your team as Jesus sees them? And here's the real question. Do they feel seen by you? Because at the end of the day, if they do not feel seen, heard by you, then it's, again, nice words on a wall. Psalm 139 speaks clearly uh, around the design that they're fearfully and wonderfully made. Jesus modeled this so well. People felt seen by him. I think of the woman at the well, the adulterous woman, Zacchaeus up in the tree, blind Bartimaeus. They just felt so seen by Jesus. And I want to bring you back to Colossians 3.10, that we are to learn, as we learn from him, we become like him. As we grow in him, we will see people the way he sees them, because that's how they're designed. This, so that's the second key to a captivating vision. First one is don't export it if you haven't imported. Number two, it's about the design. Number three, to have a captivating vision is don't cast it. Invite them to share. Jesus never pushed forced or controlled trying to get people to do something that they didn't want to do he invited them to to the, make a decision around what is it that you really want here for the client i was meeting with this morning we're we're just starting what we call the way so to speak and uh, and and their company and this is an invitation for people to come to the table because we know how they're designed so when we are clear 
and our conviction is rich around their design, then we have freedom to invite and to become whatever their role may be in, in the business. And so there's some wonderful research that we tap into on a regular basis and in the, one of the leadership assessment tools that we use. I wanna share some wonderful language and millions of leaders have been through this tool. It's a tool called the LPR, the Leadership Practices Inventory, uh, produced by Kuzas and Posner that came out of their book called The Leadership Challenge. It's a profound, rich, a data-driven, data-based approach to leadership that is just dripping with kingdom principles. So I'm going to walk you through these six. So when you think about inviting people to share an inspired vision, here are the six that you can do, and I'll be sharing with these with you uh, after our time here today. One is I talk about the future trends that will influence how our work gets done. People want to know, hey, can I have a chance to contribute? I describe a compelling image of what the future could be like. And the operating word is compelling. I appeal to others to share an exciting dream about what's possible for the future. I'm showing how their long-term interests can be realized by enlisting with us. I paint the big picture of what we, accomplish, we aspire to accomplish. And I speak with genuine, this is the authenticity, the credibility piece. I speak with genuine conviction around the higher meaning, the purpose of our work, the capacity for us in our work to add value to people's lives. When you have people who are not bent towards evil, even so if we're in our workplace, we have lots of people who don't claim Jesus. But because I know who made them, and I know they're not bent to evil in their intent, but they're bent to good in their intention, these six pieces are like strings that I can play to enroll them to something bigger and more beautiful. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. And again, I'll be sharing this with you uh, after our call today. So the third opportunity for us to cast vision is don't try to cast it or captivate a vision. Don't cast it. Invite people to enroll in it. The fourth one is to make it resonate. One of the, one of the traps that we fall into is that we compartmentalize so many of the things in our businesses. The art of doing it well is to see it infiltrate every corner of the business. And so this is uh, uh, our, our, our business model. And so what we do is we start with the owners, the executives who are claiming Christ. We work on their personal foundations around their identity, their sense of vision, their priorities, and their habits. And we spend about a year doing that work to get that into a stronger place from when they started. That informs the vision of the business it informs the people and the culture, how they lead that, which then impacts all things, sales and marketing. We call it feed the pipe, get her done, which is process improvement and keeping score, which is the finances. All with a clear eye on the great commandment, the great commission and the great call, the beauty of work. So we want to see these principles reach into and it shapes how we put our marketing plans together. Are we users or are we serving? Our financials. Are we, are, uh, are we talking headcount and line items of people? Or do our financials represent um, the opportunity of doing good? Are we just purely profit-driven? Or are we good-driven? Or which healthy profit is a core in making that happen? In our processes, are we bringing more ease or more wear and tear to people? So the, the, the kingdom way from our visioning then creeps into every corner of the business so that we're not compartmentalized, we're actually holistic in what we're bringing to the table as we lead our businesses. So the fourth way to captivate is to make sure that it's resonating. Number five then is if you wanna ensure that it resonates over the long haul, be prepared for things to get tough. Now there's three areas and I, this, this comes out of some wonderful work by a theologian pastor named uh, Greg Ogden in his uh, uh, study called Leadership Essentials. And he invites us, and I would totally agree, expect these three things. Expect temptation. The evil one is not going to be happy with you stepping into the space. This is warfare, and we need to be ready for that. Number two is expect opposition. Not everybody's going to be agreeing with you. Just talked about it this morning around another one of our clients who, as they brought this to bear, not everybody is willing to sign up. 
depending on their motives and depending on the direction that they want their lives to go. So expect opposition to your work. And number three is expect discouragement. This is hard work. This is transformative work, starting with you first. This will require everything that you've got. Um, Luke 9.23 has become so real for me. I memorized it decades ago. That whoever would take up his cross, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. This is some of the most hard work that you're going to do. And it's some of the most humbling work that you're going to do. But as we go through this, the invitation here is be aware of the weariness, the getting tired of doing good. Paul was, was doing this because he, he just outlined in, in some of the other letters where he was just getting tired. And so there's some things that you and I can do that as we become weary, as we become tired of leading into the vision of doing the work in our sales and marketing and then the process improvement and the difficult conversations that are almost daily for us is that we need to remember about the solution that Jesus went for the jugular. He entered into the disordered mess of struggling humanity. And that is the place that the Lord has you and me. He's placed you in your business for a purpose. You are not there by chance. And his calling on your life is to become more and more like him. And as you become more and more like him, the beauty of his kingdom way will attract those that are interested in seeking his face. And as he draws them to himself, it's a profound invitation to participate with the Lord in what he's doing in your workplace. So the three things you can do when your vision fades and you're losing heart, be the donkey. Ogden tells of the story of a couple of farmers who wanted to get rid of a donkey. They didn't have the heart to actually quote unquote kill the donkey. So they had a pit and they threw the donkey into the pit. Sounds a little bit like a Joseph story. And the donkey was in the pit and they began to take earth and shovel it in on top of the donkey. And over time as they're shoveling it in, all of a sudden they started to see the ears and then the head and then the body, and the donkey just kept standing on top of the dirt that was being thrown in on top of them. And so you and I need, as we face temptation, as we face um, um, opposition and discouragement, we need to be the donkey. Get back on top of the pile. And here's two things that I have done over the last couple of years. They've been profoundly challenging on a bunch of fronts. I've never been challenged uh, in the last two to four years um, I go, wow, Lord, I did not see that level of trial coming. There's been times in my story where I have felt so debilitated. Anybody with me, with me on that? Or am I alone? Where I, 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 and I'm rarely, rarely, rarely this way, but I've had mornings I actually didn't want to get out of bed. And that has not been my way. But it has been over the last uh, number of years. We've got a business that's got profoundly sideways. And it's all relationship, uh, an individual that's running the company for us, um, wonderful person. I was a coach for this person for a number of years. They showed up well. And then a couple of years into it, life went sideways for a bunch of different reasons. And it has been hell on earth for us. But it's taken me to the edge and back. And so I got to go back to the source. So while I'm in that, guess what? Like for you, this little thing called pandemic COVID hits. And all of a sudden, our revenue and our consulting practice, guess what happened to that? It crashed like 90%. We're going, okay, Lord, what do we do here? Anybody with me? Terrible. And so one of the things that I did is I would go for a daily walk, like an hour, early in the morning. I put my headset on, and I would listen to the book of Colossians or the book of Philippians once a day. I said, Father, would you just infect my being again with your sense of purpose? Because I'm losing heart here. Would you help me? And I would hear Paul. I think you may know the context. He's in a first century dungeon. Last time we checked, not a nice place. And I just hear in that his sense of purpose 
I go, Father, would you, would you inform me again? Would you infuse my heart with hope again? I did that for months daily because I could feel I was on the edge. I go, Jesus, would you save me? I don't know how to do this. And then the last one is, so be the donkey, get on, don't let it get on top of you. You get on top of it, go back to the source and don't do it alone. We live in the last 50 or 75 years in our Western Christian culture. We have cultivated a privatized view of our faith. It's not always been that way. It's to be done in community. And one of the founding tenets for the work we do is that we gather leaders and, and business owners together to do it together because it's really, really hard. If you're not careful, it'll have your lunch. So we say, look, be the donkey, get back to Jesus, back to the source, be in the scriptures, whatever it takes. I've got a playlist I would, in those times. I got my scriptures. I have my play. The moment my feet would hit the floor, I would go and uh, put on this playlist because I just needed to hear worship again. Oh, it was just grindingly hard. And I'm just on this. I, I, I'm almost hesitating as I share with this. I'm, I think I'm on the other side, but who knows what the Lord has for me tomorrow. But I can tell you that he did give me the strength that I needed to be the donkey to get back up again. I do know that when I go back to source, his spirit, the spirit of the living God infused me with faith, hope, and love again. And I'm so profoundly grateful for my friends because I didn't have to do it alone. And here's the invitation. Like, if you and I do this, here's the impact. And I want to read this for you because here's another way to put it. You, everyone in this call and those across CCBF, across Canada, you are here to be light, to bring out the God colors in the world. Can I ask for an amen? Amen. God is not a secret to be kept. We are going public with this, as public as a city on the hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you business owner leader on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on the hilltop on a light stand, shine. My question is, what am I shining? I want the presence of the living God to shine in me and through me. So keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous father in heaven. That's Pete Cooney's take on what it means to captivate a vision, to be captivated by it. And there's a, we could spend many days on the technical sides and all the tools and all the things around how to roll it out, and how to create clarity and how to avoid the, the seduction of certainty and how to pursue clarity on vision and all those things. But I, would, I felt today, no, I wanted to serve you with an invitation. To, let's go back to the, to the source. Who's informing our vision? And are we captivated by him first so others will be captivated of him in us and through us? So, Don, back to you. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for that very inspiring presentation. It's uh, given us lots to think about and lots to ponder. Now, we have about 15 minutes. We'll be open to take questions or, in fact, you may wish to share things between yourselves. So it's quite doable, too. Uh, and so, as you've heard this presentation, uh, what's what's been sparked in your mind? Uh, is there a, a challenge you've received? Is there something you're wrestling with? Something you're curious you'd like to ask? I just opened it up to you. I've got some questions in mind, but I'd be happy to hear from you. So feel free to uh, share those now with Pete or with the group. This is always a beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in. Uh, I, I wondered, Pete, if you would say a little more about how love informs our thinking for business owners. Mm. Uh, like, like a couple of, like, where would that show up? How do you see people applying that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Peggy, thanks for that. Uh, so, uh, first things first, uh, let's, let's uh, create a common understanding when I, when I use the word love. Uh, let's, let's make sure we're all uh, on the same page around the definition of that. Uh, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not talking about the erotic or I love my pizza. 
All right, so let's set that aside. The best definition I've come across over the years is this, that I choose to extend myself to the highest good of another. Mm. Okay. So when I think about the business then, um, when I think about that, I've had many discussion as an example, how does love show up in a business? Um, one of the seductions in the Christian community is that profit's a terrible thing. Mm. I almost feel guilty that I'm making money. Mm. And well, at least, and so, and I've had this so many times that this is not theoretical. I'm in this discussion weekly with owners at times. Yeah. Well, at least I can make money so I can cut a check to do some good elsewhere, as an example. And I go, where, that is just, it's terrible theology, one. Mm -hmm. And it's just profoundly crippling as another. Mm -hmm. And it's not only crippling for the owner, but it's crippling for the very good that we can do because we actually are learning to run a profitable business. Mm -hmm. So for example, I was just sharing with, uh, with our, our uh, new client this morning. When we learn how to run the business the kingdom smart way, all things being equal, it can't help but not make money. It can't help but do it. Mm -hmm. Now, the impact of that is uh, one of our clients over the last uh, four or five years, uh, the first two years of our engagement with him, his average wage for his employee went up five bucks an hour. Wow. Nice. In two years. In that two years, he also put in a profoundly beautiful benefits package. He's in the construction industry. Um, he's got lots of young men who, uh, which a good percentage, never finished high school. They feel trapped, uncared for, just a whole bunch. There's a big commentary around it. But he loves his guys. And so love shows up because I'm going to run this thing better and better because then I can give them a even well above a living wage. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that they can take care of their family. So I'm going to put a wonderful benefits package in place. And the third thing he did in two years is that he put a group shared RSP plan in place because most of them are financial acumen is terrible. They, they, they've never learned how to budget. And he says, at least when they turn 65, they have something left over. In two years, that's how love showed up in that business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As an example. Nice. Mm -hmm. That's really uh, encouraging. Uh, one of my depressions lately has simply been uh, that with the advent of everything tech, which is, you know, it, which has some real wonderful benefits, I just feel like people are declining in value. Mm -hmm. And it really bothers me. And there's no, there's no rationale for it. Like there's no need for it. But I just see this in so many businesses. I, I don't know. People are units, their numbers, their data, their data points, their, you know, their, uh, their markets. Uh, and I just feel like we're like, how do you work with that um, and keep the humanity in it? Like, 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 in, like, like uh, increase the humanity in it as opposed to causing people to feel so alienated. Yeah. These are big issues. I don't know. That's my, that's one of my latest. Well, and, and <laughs> they're, they're, they're huge for us. Right. And I, I think that's my invitation because if I actually claim Jesus and I believe that he is who he says he is, and I am who I am as he declares and that his, and I make myself, I submit, I surrender to his life-changing power. I can't help but over time produce more fruit. Because it's the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. It's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. If I'm being infused by the fruit of the spirit, like at the end of the day, how hard does a cherry tree work at producing its cherries? Mm. It doesn't. It just does because it's designed to do that. So when we are one growing in our oneness with the father, I can't help but lead my business in an ever increasing way that can do more good and bring more humanity to it. Being human is a beautiful thing. Genesis 1 and 2, it's all about being human. Just Genesis 3 twisted it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think, the, I think the answer is Christ following business owners who are Jesus following They've been equipped to be disciple-making leaders in the context of their business. I was just talking with our friends this morning. When we do reviews without chapter and verse, we're inviting people to grow in character, godly character, and they don't even know it. 
doing reviews in a company is a gorgeous opportunity to make disciples. We're inviting them to become as they were designed to be. They just don't know it yet. Mm-hmm. That's love at work, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I have no passion around this stuff. Uh, one of the issues <laughs> I find with the smaller owners, um, whether they have a team or not, it relates actually not so much to the passion and wanting to make a difference because many of the business owners I work with, that's, you know, that's really a key thing for them. Sure. But, but what they lack is the, the ability to implement a vision using technology, using uh, business planning skills, using financial skills, and so on. So that's another whole area um, where uh, hopefully we can, we can love business owners. You know, I, I set up my business to speak into that. The leadership is crucial, the leadership development. Um, but lots of people, they just don't have the skills they need to build out all the moving parts and connect the dots on them. So that's, it's just a different uh, spin on the question, I guess. Sure. And, 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 you, and you're so right with that, Lois. Uh, I think my invitation would be let's learn from the master again, uh, because he had a bunch of bumbling uh, young men around him. And, you know, in my elder age, uh, I'd be a bumbling dude as well. And what did he say? No, I need to spend time with you. I need to equip you. And then he gave the charge, the Great Commission. So our model is, and I think it's the invitation for us in our businesses, we come alongside. We show them how we equip them. And so we're, no long, we're not only talking about it, which is beautiful. We're not only speaking about it, but we, um, our contention is that we need to become Jesus following first, then be equipped as a disciple-making leader. So we can actually see the pervasive, invasive, forceful reality of the gospel of Jesus infect our businesses. And the, and the strategy there is one at a time. One at a time. One at a time. Small groups. That's how Jesus did it. And I haven't found a better way yet. And I have a lot of gray hair now. So. <laughs> Well, um, Pete, I appreciate everything you've said, and thanks for sharing it. Uh, there's so much of what you've said resonates with what we try to help people understand in our Venerlink values. But would you would you just speak for a minute to the significant mind transformation of a person mm-hmm. realizing they are stewards of a God business rather than owners of something they've created? with God's help. And so this whole issue of stewardship versus ownership, to me, Mm -hmm. it's a significant Mm -hmm. pattern that would maybe help some people in this whole visioning and and then actually unveiling that vision. Would you speak to that a minute or am I? Yeah. Yeah, Marvin, thanks for that. You're really getting at the heart, uh, at the heart of the issue uh, with that question. Um, the folks that we work with, um, when, when, they, when they come and begin to work with us, they would not articulate all the things that I'm saying, nor would I necessarily give up to them all. They may hear me speak somewhere, um, but the big thing that we're looking for, something stirring inside them for something more. More often than not, they're in their 40s and 50s and they're tired. Now, we've got a number of entrepreneurs that are in their 30s, but more often than not, they're in their 40s and 50s, and they've been trying it as owners for a long time, and they're left wanting. So part of it is to listen for the pain. Jesus did that all day long. He just, he met people in their pain. And if they are not willing to own their pain or acknowledge their pain, there's not much that you and I are going to be able to do for them. Jesus didn't try. He just invited them. He didn't push as I said earlier. So part of the invitation for us is to become and just see where the Lord's at work. I've uh, early in my career, I did not understand that very well. And I, uh, you know, thought of myself more highly uh, as I ought uh, than I ought as uh, Paul writes in in Philippians uh, chapter two. And uh, the Lord writes, I said, you know, that's, that's a whole nother talk. Um, But I've learned, no, Lord, where are you at work here? Are you at work in this person's life? Do they want, they don't, may not know how, but they're longing for the shift from being an owner to a steward. They may not use those words, but underneath it, you can feel the hunger. 
for something more significant. The second part of that, so watch for where the Lord's at work. Number two is there's no microwave. It takes time. And so the transformation process is one of the daily, everyday life, just bring it before the Lord. And you just see the fruit of the spirit begin to show up over time as the questions come up, as they make that shift from ownership to stewardship. Because stewardship is all around the things that I just presented to you today. So that's a wonderful language around that, Marvin. Thank you. That's stewarding the gift of the gospel. That's stewarding bringing the kingdom to bear in everything that I do. That's stewarding the trust, not only the work of people, but the well-being of the people that are under my care. So those two things for me, and then uh, no, there's no microwave. And then uh, the third one is, uh, I, I don't think we talk enough around taking seriously the call to make disciples as a core responsibility as a Jesus following steward of a business. Now, I say that with no judgment. For the most part, I don't believe we know how to help one another do that very well. And Don's sitting there, I'm sure you go, yeah, Pete's got a pretty strong navigator bias here. Um, I didn't grow up in the church. I, that's not a negative. I, I just didn't. I grew up, um, our God, our religion was hard work on the farm that I was raised on. So I came to faith through the navigators at the University of Guelph back a uh, long time ago when the earth was still green. <laughs> And I, I don't know of any other way to think than coming alongside and investing my life in another person. I, I, I don't, I can't operate any other way. And that's, I suggest, the stewardship of an owner. I come alongside the people entrusted to me. So we can talk a lot more on that, but that's enough for now, Marvin. Can I say a couple of stuff? Um, is that okay? Or we don't Yeah, please. Go right ahead. I was just going to say, I was just uh, reading yesterday about George Soros um, giving altogether about almost 20 billion plus for his causes for the ego ship like whatever he wants to design the world the way he did and they were saying combination of all others his was the highest um, I guess with the stewardship what I was going to say is and of course what he's doing to influence his son and how they're getting into universities in terms of promoting all his agendas right so I guess if the passion and the heart was there for God's work, that would just transpire in terms of what we have, right? So that was just one point I saw, like, you know, he will do anything, not only to give his money, to put a mark and have his son to take over whatever he is putting in. So that's one. But the other point I was going to say was, uh, I do have a, an organization that I absolutely love, it's called, um, World Spirit Business Association here mm. in UCA. I don't know if you know of them. No. Uh, it's just an amazing group. And this is the first time, I don't even know how I end up <laughs> uh, coming to this meeting, which I'm happy to. I was just wondering if it was possible to get the recording so that I share with them and see if they want to join or if you want to hear, you know, just I thought, you know, God's people working together, kind of, there's always growth, that would go together so just it was a question yeah following this uh presentation today later this afternoon or tomorrow p and i'll compile not only a recording of this presentation but some extra resources because pete has got lots of things that he'd love to share about what they do that just can't be included in this presentation and so uh, we'll make sure that everyone on the call and those who registered that didn't make the call uh, get a copy of that no problem Eden. thank you yeah, for sure. And one, one of the things that I'm reminded of, uh, Eden, as well, just as a quick comment, I, I love and I was just I was listening to a Tim Keller talk uh, recently, uh, like Jesus didn't go to the elite. He went to the lowly fishermen, and he changed the world. And so I'm not diminishing the impact of billions. I'm grateful for that if it's doing good. I really am. Um, but I do know that the beauty of the, the beauty of one, the beauty of just an everyday person who's fully committed, fully given over to the beauty of Jesus in them and through them, that's the power. I can just testify. I have to run shortly, but I was part of the founders of uh, Advisors with Purpose where 
we got Christian advisors to transform their businesses according to these same principles that Peter uh, talked about. And uh, it was just transformational for all of the people that were engaged in that. Um, and when you live out your principles, it's just amazing how God um, is in control of your success and your benefits. And um, yeah, it's just been the most incredible journey. Uh, I, I had transformed my business into a marketplace ministry in 2005 with my employees and ended up traveling to Israel, almost like sold my practice a number of years ago um, and working in a different industry now and with Christian business who does the same, very similar process. And it's just, it's a completely different way of living and working and, and would support everything Peter said too, that it's mm. tremendously transformational when you have a a stewardship mentality. I even carry around my cards all the time about my steward's manifesto and my marketplace ministry. And my office was always filled with wonderful Christian resources. And I never had an atheist complain, never had my Jewish people or Muslim clients ever complain. And um, God will bless our heart and our intention has been my experience. So I have to run. I've got another yep. one, but God bless you all. Peter, thank not. you so much. Lovely yes. meeting everyone. Yes. Thanks, Ruby. Well, our time has basically uh, come to a conclusion now and we need to wrap up, but I do want to express heartfelt appreciation to uh, Pete for this excellent presentation. And I hope many of you will uh, not mm. only, it, not only I hope you've not only enjoyed it, but that you'll actually take this presentation and share it with other leaders in your circle of influence. And uh, so let's let's do that. Let's just give Pete a round of applause. Well, thank you for sharing your uh, afternoon with me. I appreciate well, it. Well, I, I just want to encourage you all to know that next month we'll be having a special presentation uh, similar to this one, only it's gonna be around problem solving in business. And uh, unfortunately she stepped off the call, but Jen Paul, who is the CEO and founder of Digital, Digital Consultants in Toronto. It's had lots of experience working in the banking industry and now in helping businesses across the country. Uh, she'll be presenting problem solving a business. So mark down on your calendars, October 20th. I know that'll be a treat to have her join us. Uh, Jen also serves as one of the members of our CCBF board and has made tremendous contributions to even our website and our work digitally. So as I mentioned at the outset, for those who came on the call later, uh, remember the first Wednesday of October will be our uh, business and prayer day for 45 minutes. I hope some of or all of you can join us for that time. Thanks again, Pete. God bless you all. Have a great day and a great week ahead. Bye for now. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.